Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Dylan Optics Sunglasses. You know those really cool sunglasses you see me wearing in every single video we've ever made, pretty much? Them's called Dylan Optics, and they are made right here in the U.S. of A., Scottsdale, Arizona, in fact. And there's so many things that I love about these sunglasses, on top of the fact that they are our longest sponsor. They've been with us for 13 years years. They make the best glasses around. The NIR lens technology means that the polarization is even stronger than other high-end brands, and you can see it immediately. It's like HD life the second you put on Dylan Optics sunglasses. Plus, you've got that cool, instantly recognizable matte finish lens available in a whole bunch of different colors. In fact, every pair of Dylan's is made to order. So you choose your frame style from up to 20 different styles. They've got the metal frame, the wire frame, the aviator style, the wraparound style, the wayfarer style, so many multiple frame colors. Then you choose your lens. So the odds of seeing someone else with the same set of Dylan's as you are super, super small. Dylan's are also available in prescription. You can send them your prescription and they will make you a pair uh, that fits perfectly. My wife wears prescription Dylan sunglasses and they are awesome. They look just like the other ones, but they are for your jacked up eyes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you go to thesmokingtire.com and click on that partners tab, you'll see the banner for Dylan Optics. That's the link. You don't have to type in any codes. Just go to thesmokingtire.com. Click on that banner. That'll take you over to their website. And when you order, we will send you a free smoking tire t-shirt for supporting the people who support us. Every pair you buy gets you a free t-shirt. Right? Right. Also, it's important to know this uh, contest that we've got going on right now for a prototype version, one of one dark teal dial, a prototype watch of my Notice Canyon uh, that I designed with Notice watches. This is amazing. There are a couple of ways to enter. You can go over to my Instagram and find it. Um, basically, you have to either sign up for bethematch.com, and you can. That's an entry. Okay, you could donate blood or platelets, that's an entry, or you could donate a hundred dollars to be the match.com. I'm sorry, it's org. It's not even com. It's be the match.org. Uh, donate a hundred dollars or more. And if you send your proof of any of those things, either signing up and, and becoming a donor at be the match, uh, donating blood or platelets, or donating $100, send that to peaceunique at thesmokingtire.com. Again, head over to Instagram. I've written this all out. You don't have to remember it. And if you go over there, you'll see that dark teal watch. That's how you can win it. There is only one like it that we will ever make, and you can take it home. I don't even have one. It's just for you. All right. On this episode of the podcast, it is a crew show, and Zach and I uh, recorded it at the brand new Westside Collector Car Storage Gardena South Bay facility. Um, it's a fun show. We talk about the UAW strike. We talk about uh, the Polaris slingshot. We talk about some things that are going on in the news. I wear my new reading glasses. Ooh, boy, do I look smart in those and the Bentley flying spur that I'm driving this week. Uh, there is a, uh, a camera snafu around 51 minutes into the show and uh, Zach gets cut off. So after 51 minutes, the video version of the show will get a little wonky, but the audio is good. Uh, this is a fun show live at uh, West Side Collector Car Storage, South Bay. It's a crew show on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Yet luxurious. This is pretty luxurious. This couch. This, this is, is nice. A, this is a luxurious couch yeah. here at West Side Collector Car Storage, South Bay. It's almost like a road show. Mm-hmm. But not. Without an audience. But not. <laughs> we decided we would leave the studio today. Actually, we're down here because we're going to shoot the, uh, the walkthrough video mm -hmm. of the new shop. And we thought... We should do a podcast here as well. Yeah, because things have changed since I was last. I was last year when Catskin installed the seats on the Corvette. Mm. 
There's a lot more customer there's cars way here more now. Cars. Yeah, I mean, there's like ninety percent more cars. Yeah, there's a lot more cars. I think we've got twenty, twenty six, twenty seven customer cars here now. Um, we had a very you know we opened July one, and it was stressful because not only was I traveling over twenty days of the of the that month, so I couldn't really pay the kind of attention here that I needed to, but also everyone else was traveling in L.A. like. People fuck off for the summer. They just don't stick around. And so, um, you know, we really had a slow opening month. And I had, as usual, a panic attack about being a total failure and uh, being an idiot. And and then, you know, I came back from my travels and I was able to focus a little bit on our marketing strategy, on getting our website finished to better reflect two locations, on various little things that that I couldn't pay attention to because I was in like Germany and Monaco mm -hmm. and whatever and people came back from their summer vacations and uh, phones started ringing customers started moving in and now we've got a really interesting spread of cars back here I'm not really sure what the camera is seeing but I mean we've got uh, you know two beautiful NSX's, one of which is mine. You know, we've got two GT4 RS's, we've got a Ferrari 355, we've got that center seat uh, 911, 997. We've got a Ferrari 400i and a Portofino. Um, we've got a, a Mitsubishi Evo 10. We've got this Bugatti Type, Type 35. That's a per Yeah, yeah. Um, but but still Oh my rad. God, the presence is incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've got a couple of GT3s. Uh, we've got some interesting, uh, that Land Cruiser back there. And there's another, uh, another Land Cruiser over there and a, a G wagon and, and an overlanding van. And we've got five or six motorcycles moved in. So it's, uh, going better. Yeah. A lot better. Very yeah, good. Going better. Well, I hope that by the time, you know, I think it's going to be 12 to 18 months before our second building right next door is finished. And so the idea is to have this building full by the time that building is done. So I see With that. a little bit of a waiting list so that I people now, get yeah, excited. Yeah. Yeah. I now see that as a more, a more like, you know, you want to be full as quick as possible. But like, if I can fill this one by the time we open that one, then the cadence will be, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to open a new building where the, without the demand being there. And so I think if we have, like we've had two new, two new move-ins a week or one to two new move-ins a week for the next 12, you know, months, we will be golden. Nice. Plus uh, events, you know, September 30th, we've got the Brecky Car Club event is here. Um, Saturday, September 23rd, uh, we're going to have Manhattan Beach Cars and Coffee will be here at, at Westside Collect Car Store South Bay. Both of those events are open to the public. So two Saturdays in a row, we'll be having uh, having events here. So uh, and other people have asked us now about events, the Avant magazine guys. And and um, so now that we have this huge outside space so uh, big. to play with, yeah, it's cool. It'll be great. So anyway. and, and, a, and a number of patrons have asked if we're going to ever do live Live shows here the answer is yes of course that's yeah. just it's in the works yeah i thought about maybe doing one with the brecky car club event and having a lot but there's like so many other things going on and i really anticipate doing a lot of marketing for the shop at that event so i didn't want to do it at the same time but like yes like this area in between the two buildings here is like perfect for that live outdoor sort of a drive-in type experience yeah and um, I mean, we could all. And this is a little narrow. I was gonna say we could do a is, smaller, intimate inside one. Inside is a little narrow. We yeah. could probably do something where we have a stage here and we have audience going both ways, yeah. like that. We could do that uh, if we wanted to do indoors. Yeah. Um, do we buy or rent shares? I'm not really sure how that works. Depends on the rental price and yeah. the price of tickets. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Someone needs to do some math that I haven't done yet. Uh, speaking of which, shout out to uh, our friend Phil McGovern just opened the second um, caffeine, caffeine machine. machine. It's called The Bowl. So if you're in the UK, if you're a UK listener, please go visit him and buy a coffee or a beer or a hoodie. Their merch is so comfortable. Their merch that is, is good. like the best shirt I've bought that in hoodie, a long time. I, That hoodie I bought from them is very dope. Um, oh, nice. after the last uh, show, a couple people reached out to me. Fortunately, they were they were nice about it. They weren't shitty about it. 
uh, about the, the th- what we were saying about the hydrogen um, and uh, and what we were, you know, where my power comes from at night, whatever. Apparently, the, the, they sent me some charts. In California, there is, while there is some coal, most of my nighttime power that I'm charging my Ford with is natural gas. Okay. So it's not necessarily renewable. Uh, it's not necessarily clean power the way that our more of our daytime power is. Um, and, and I was pretty much accurate about California's very limited capacity to store energy at night. I mean, I think that's energy period like right. I think it's, it's not just california thing right well that, yeah. california is what we were talking about okay, so i, right. I don't want to i don't want to overstep my bounds i'm going for it go for it dude but uh <laughs> but yeah more natural gas than coal in california so uh yeah people sent me some some charts and some like you know and i think they understood that it was were it was it was not me at a science symposium it was two guys drinking bourbon talking about this shit so um but i appreciate the correction it's okay um, also, people found uh, the bad morning radio segment. In oh, they, five did. they found it so fast. They found it fast as fuck. And, and I, I listened to it. And unfortunately, the segment where the host says, well, fuck, you know, he turns into Alex Jones and screams, go fuck off then to me. That did not make air. Um, instead, what made air was him basically complaining that I hung up on him, which actually he hung up on me. I didn't hang up on him, um, but he, he, you know, he complained and, and said that uh, basically that I was being. Um, I don't know what the I forget what the word was. I only listened to it oh, once. Yeah. It say? was like needy or or something like that. Like he basically said I was being a pussy because he fucked up my name and I didn't just roll with it, which like like prima donna ish. Prima, yeah, yeah something that's not like that. Used, but he, yeah, something, that's, that was his intent. something like that, and like. I get it, right? He this guy really had to be the alpha. So he had to go back on there and, you know, come up with a reason that he didn't do anything wrong right. and that and that that I was just I wasn't being cool about it. Which like okay, like you can feel that way if you want, but like you still fucked up my name and and you, you know, it's it, like I'm if you're not going to like I'm just not going to give you my time at that point. It, it would be it would be interesting to talk to a radio producer that works like I feel like he that show is part of the old model. Like a producer lined you up yeah. as a guest yeah. makes sense for their 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 show and market, but it seemed like the host had no idea who you were or that you were coming on the show or yeah. what you did, and it's not someone's job to know everything about everyone in the world, but. I go, okay, well, why does the producer not brief the host on who's coming on, especially yeah. if it's like a guested car show? Car World's not that big right. also. So that was a little surprising to me. Yeah, I, I, that does happen where producers try to book guests and the host doesn't necessarily know about them. And like that sort of happened to me again yesterday. I did a podcast where the main host didn't really, not that they didn't know who I was, but like didn't, didn't really know what they what I thought they might have known. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the, the co-host did know more. So I was able to take what they said and spin it into the thing and fine, whatever. But, um, but like just, it's more about like, take a little ownership, dude. Like, yeah, you know, like a little bit, like just be like, you know, it's, it's, if, if you, insult someone on the air by like not you know getting their name right like I, maybe i don't know maybe maybe they think differently about this stuff than i do like yeah i'm gonna go do a radio show or a podcast because i'm selfishly promoting the shop or our show or whatever and like there's something in it for me mm-hmm. but at the same time like I don't, it's not that much in it for us, <laughs> you know, like there's not, there's not that much in it and it's not, I'm not being paid. Mm-hmm. It's like, it, you know, well, it should take effort on both sides, I think is what it is. Like you're, you're going to show up and, and try to be a good guest and tell good stories and be entertaining. And then whoever's hosting you on the show should either, you know, do some homework or be respectful. Um, and if they mess up, 
the guest's name, they should take it on the <clears throat> take it on the chin and admit they made a mistake. Yeah, and I think like take some ownership. What was a, you know, what what I thought was strange was in the edit is that they basically made you seem like the one hundred percent bad person. They cut out the part. Of leading up to that where they talked to you beforehand yeah. and it was basically like well you were defenseless because you were cut off of the show yeah. so they just they could say whatever they wanted yeah which um, like yeah, whatever. I don't know I feel like if I fucked something up or when I do fuck something up I, I try to take ownership of it yeah correct it's very rare that I double down and blame the person that I that I you know offered or that I, mean, I think it's uh, important what's both the word? for know. one's integrity a person's that our education and growth as humans and then also the internet is forever yeah so if you fuck something up and try to roll past it yeah. you know it, the internet will remind you constantly right uh, in the comments you know even if it's years later yeah so i don't know it, it it was it was i was not surprised that the part where he screamed at me was not on the air i figured that maybe it was live and they cut it for the youtube oh, feed later um but uh Anyway, anyway, they found the fans found it. So <laughs> they found it before the show. Ended. They found it very quickly. And a couple people were like, I didn't have to look. I knew exactly yeah. who you were talking about. <laughs> They're locals. Uh, in Texas. The, yeah, the locals. They, they know about that guy. Um, so yesterday we uh, we went out and drove the slingshot. Polaris slingshot. Um, I was very dirty when I got home. It's hard to stay clean. I mean, I guess if you're if you're not making a bunch of U-turns and dirt turnouts, it's probably fine. Mm. But if you are, you're still exposed the elements, getting yeah. hit with everything. And it's got that it the exhaust dumps under the thing, so if you pull off into a dusty lot, it just it just blows dust into the air. I had to take Claritin before bed because <laughs> there's just so much pollen and stuff was shoved into my face. Yeah, you're outside. Yeah, you're yeah. definitely outside with that. No more so than a motorcycle, but but you're outside. But you, but. From your eyeballs forward, you think you're in a car, and yeah. then you're actually in a motorcycle, yeah. sort of. And it's such a, it's a strange vehicle because as you drive it, like from the from the steering wheel forward, it's so good. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean it's it's, it's double so wishbone suspension. Like if you told me that the person that engineered it spent a little time at Lotus. I'm not saying it rides as well as a Lotus because it, it's so light, it, yeah. it, bump, it shakes over things a little bit more, yeah. but it has super wide track, double wishbone suspension, really fast steering quick ratio, steering ratio, good steering feel, and yeah. it's, an, it's an electronic system, like all that stuff. I'd go, okay, yeah, they, 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 they like Lotus. They're yeah. doing, doing a tribute, sort of. Yeah, uh, and, and that's all in the front. Right. And then the back is just a mess. It's yeah, it's weird, it's very um, weird. Obvious, like so I, I said this on a previous show but the reason we drove this is because I met a guy who uh, works at Polaris as an engineer who basically said you know we re-engineered this car in 2020 it's got 70% new parts content and it's uh, and the people that, that did the engineering are racers and autocrossers and we really care about dynamics and there are limitations with the three wheel design but we did the best we could uh, to make it as drive as good as it could drive and, and I remember you didn't like the first one but we have another go and this dude was not lying like the, the power is better, it revs to 8,500, the shifter feel is good, the pedal feel is great, the clutch engagement is great, it's light, it, it turns in really fast, the steering ratio is really quick, um, but it's still got three wheels, mm -hmm. so there's, there's just some real limitations to what you can do with it. Yeah, and, and I was watching you, when we did the in-car, we were talking about does that rear shock compress one cornering? Because the forces are going, you know, to the left or the right. Yeah. But it's in the center. And then when I watched you go around corners, the rear wheel was fairly static unless you hit a very pronounced bump that was like in the middle of the road. And then mm -hmm. of course it would compress to keep that tire on the ground. And and I was thinking about it last night, and I think if that tire, you know, it can't lean. If it yeah. leaned, it would then be probably a little bit more dangerous. Oh. Folks got to take a quick break from the action to pay a few bills. And today them bills are being paid by Brook Linen in their fall collection. They make bedding, sheets, pillowcases, duvet covers, all that stuff. In fact, they sent me all of that stuff and I am sleeping in it right now, tonight. I got some new colors. I got some new patterns. My, it's like a whole new bed over there. I like the sheets because they stay cool, right? You know, I'm a hot, I'm a hot sleeper. 
That probably wouldn't surprise you. But my very petite wife, uh, very petite, very fit, also a hot sleeper. That one may be a bit of a surprise. And these sheets are nice and cool. But it's the perfect time to upgrade your bedding and some home essentials. As we get into fall, you're spending more time inside and uh, keeping it cozy. You know what I'm saying? Brooklinen is where it's at. It was founded by a husband and wife duo in 2014, and their mission is to provide their customers with hotel-quality, award-winning luxury bedding. They've got over 100,000 five-star reviews and endorsements from the experts at Good Housekeeping and Wirecutter, and uh, Brooklinen sheets are made with long staple cotton for longevity and softness. Haven't had them long enough to endorse the longevity portion of it yet, but they are soft and delightful. It is a serious upgrade to your bedroom. Grab that bed and bath bundle for a good night's rest and a new at-home spa routine. You can save time and up to 25% when bundling your new favorite home essentials. Experience the difference for yourself. Check out Brooklinen's new fall collection. You can visit them in-store or online at brooklinen.com and use Use code TIRE, T-I-R-E, for 20 bucks off your online order of $100 or more. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code TIRE, $20 off. Love that Brooklinen. We are also brought to you today by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just you against the numbers instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks. You pick more than or less than on two through six player stat project projections and watch the winnings just roll in. Prize Picks is the most fun I've ever had, winning up to 25 times my money this football season. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. It's really simple to play. Make my picks, submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts every Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts. Select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. And they offer now Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this football season. Right? Right. I'm picking players. I'm choosing more than, less than. That's easy. It is fun. It is straightforward. And uh, you can get some skin in the game. Go to prizepicks.com slash tire and use code tire for a first deposit match up to $100. Right? prizepicks.com slash tire. And then use code tire for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. And now back to the show. Oh, we got to pay your power bill. Motion sensor lights need to be motion activated. <laughs> That's we've, great. We've sat too still. That's really funny. So California law, motion motion activated lights. Oh, really? Yeah, for, I, for energy savings. I mean, I like them a lot at, at the other location. Yeah. I do. I think they, it makes they so work. much sense yeah, to save you money. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what makes the back fun, you know, in a closed course situation. Like right. you could slide it really easily. It's really easy to slide. And with the um, quick steering rack, it's really easy to counter steer yeah. and hold a slide. Auto crossing would be very fun. Like right. You could just do a drift lap. And it what, I want to say, like, it doesn't slide. You know, we were on a really bumpy canyon road and it wasn't stepping out when you didn't want it to. It's not like unsafe in that way. I think no, it's just if, if you, you if push you it a little bit too far, yeah. it, it's going to break away progressively. But but it is going to break away. It, it doesn't is. just grip up and lean. Yeah, it's it's got tons of front grip because the the tire and the geometries compared to the weight are e exceptional. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't have the rear grip. It's got just over half of what it should have in the rear. Right. I mean, I can imagine. I know. I know that someone has done a four wheeled conversion for these things. I don't know how it works mechanically. I don't know if they just do. There is. There's a four a kit to make this thing four wheels. Why? Why? Well, because it's For better. Because it's better than three wheels. But, but then. But why don't you just have a car at that point? Yeah, because then you have a 200 horsepower four wheeled vehicle that, 
Like that all, you have that Honda it, Civic power, yeah, yeah, yeah. but none of the comfort. No, or I, I don't engineering. know. I okay. mean, because, right. because people do people, yeah, people build like shit. To tinker. Yeah, okay. people tinker. People build shit. I yeah, mean, that's, 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 that's why. Like, and if you love that's everything, why hot air balloons? It, yeah, not effective I mean, at you, almost if anything. If you love everything about a slingshot except the three wheels, like you can change that. That's true. You know, like if if you want, KTM's over there going like, we have the crossbow. Hello. Yeah, which not you know. Is that not, rules? Yeah, but not legal in the U.S. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. They make they make too many of them for the ultra low volume manufacturer act, but not enough that that they could justify the standards. Yeah. Mm. Um, there might be a way. Like my buddy, uh, my buddy Ben had one in the U.S. in like 2011. Now, don't know how he did that. Don't don't know what he also had some weird other Euro shit that should not have really been here, like a CLK DTM before it was 25 years old. Like, I don't know if that, if a KTM crossbow was, if it was show and display or, I don't really know how he did that, but like I did remember for the car show, for the speed show, I drove it. We did? Yeah, in Seattle, in the rain. Ariel Adam versus crossbow. I wasn't on that shoot, that's why I don't remember it, but okay. Yeah, but I I did drive it in 2011. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the paperwork was on it, and he doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> if there was paperwork at all, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know where it came from. But um, anyway, to go back to the to the slingshot, when you have the, the great dynamics in the front and not great dynamics at the rear, it's almost like uh, like lunch trays, like driving on lunch trays. Yeah, you kind know? of is. Yeah, um, but it's it's really easy to slide it, um, and uh, you know, allegedly. I may have done been able to do some very controlled sliding on some uphill sections when nobody was around. Um, I mean, it also it lights the tire up in second gear. Yeah. With traction on, yeah. like as you hit six thousand RPM, it just starts doing a rolling burnout, mm-hmm. which is it. It feels like the safest rolling burnout I've ever experienced, actually, because it's just one wheel. It's not pushing you one way or another. Yeah. It just tracks totally straight. So it actually has traction and stability control. Yeah. So if you tr- if you if you leave traction on, everything on, it will light up the tire in second gear. Mm-hmm. If you turn traction control off, it will allow you to get get and hold a couple of degrees of a slide and it will just, it won't kill the power. It'll just limit it. And it actually does a pretty good job. And then if you go full off, you can do big ass fucking slides in this mm-hmm. thing. Now, I'm not sure I'd wanna, you know, like reverse entry it at 70 miles an hour. That seems, but in in a slow hairpin second gear corner, it's actually kind of a good time. Mm-hmm. And with it the is. steering being as fast as it is, you don't really have to hand over hand. You can just kind of go 90 degrees either way and it works. On the other hand, so like, so like dynamically it's better than it looks, even with its limitations. But it's also like, kind of embarrassing to drive it's very it's extremely extroverted i feel like i'm driving a fireworks show right it's just not like the colors are very bright you, obviously the colors are, are changeable but it's so strange looking and then the front is there's like it's like a predator face i mean it makes yeah. lexus look restrained just because it has the most attention grabbing design yeah trying to look like this weird transformer alien so everyone's turning their heads and then you can't hide because there's no roof there's no door there's no window yeah you're just you're just there i hide in a full face helmet is, uh, that does my, is me hiding man my neighbor <laughs> my neighbor <laughs> is like a 70 year old uh black reverend liter- a literal reverend willie and he is the man i love willie he's the coolest he's got an old porsche in his garage it's been rotting for 20 years and i every every time i'm like willie you let me know when you're ready yeah project status um <laughs> but he came over to the house yesterday because i had the bentley outside man let me see that bentley you know, and I'm showing him all this stuff, showing him a sticker. And he goes, man, you look, you look good in this. I saw when you drove up, you look, you look real good in this, man. I go, it's a Bentley. Everybody looks good. But it's also a beautiful green. It's a beautiful color. I mean, color. this spec is yeah, like, amazing. yeah, I'd walk on the parking lot and buy that and then leave with it. It's amazing. Ooh. But he, and I go, oh, thanks. So I go, you know, everybody looks good in a Bentley. He goes, yeah, but you see you in a lot of cars, man. He goes, you look good in everything. 
And I was like, thank you, Will. He goes, except that three-wheel thing. You, had. He goes, you look stupid as hell in that. <laughs> he goes, I thought you looked dumb. And then I saw you put the helmet on, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> Willie, Willie was not about He's it. He's accurate. Yeah. Full face is the way to go. I mean, it's, yeah. it's an exciting, interesting thing. And it's different. And you know what? Like, life can be very mundane. I, I get the, I understand why people buy them and yeah. drive them like uh, on the chemical level. It's yeah. Just, it's just, it's, and, and it, it sucks that we're at a place now where you actually kind of have to take that thing seriously as a, as a fun car option, even though it's not a car, because there are so few fun, affordable cars left. And very I mean, few that are playful and rear wheel drive. Yeah. I mean, really it's, it's, it's Miata, 86. it's 86, it's Mustang. And but but the like, but this thing the slingshot R w- was like thirty three thousand mm-hmm. dollars so that's like a GR eighty six right mm-hmm. but a Miata when I looked it up if you want the Miata Club with the good diff and then the Recaros you're at thirty seven yeah and that's not with a hard top that's still soft top Mustang GT starts at yeah you're not you're in the you're 50s. in the forties the fifties with track yeah. pack like everything is so expensive yeah that, that's yeah you can get a you can get a taste of you know, Lotus life or Caterham life for 31 to $33,000. Yeah. I will say that you can, you know, if you want to buy like a well-used Elise, you could spend just a little bit more money and get that. But mm-hmm. like actually a slingshot has like, mo- like it has like nav and car play True. and USB ports and cooled seats. And it actually has more equipment. Except it doesn't have a roof or doors or windows. True. Yeah. There's an optional, there's those. an optional quote roof. It's not like a real roof. Yeah. It's like a, bimini, it's a rain cover. It's like a bimini roof. Yeah. It's an umbrella. Um, but you know, like I, I think they they did a, 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 as good a job as could can be done, given the constraints of yeah. a three wheeled vehicle made by a snowmobile company. Yeah, they they had a target and a, they did a great job at yeah. that target. Yeah, you know, it's like it's not it's not up to us to decide whether or not this vehicle should exist or who. No. Want, like people clearly want them. They've been selling it for seven uh, nine years. I yeah, think it came out in twenty fourteen. Yeah, they sell a bunch of them. They sell a ton of them. Yeah, so they've d- they've done a good job with the idea. Yeah. So um, our video is coming out um, what next week? Uh, is it by the time they weeks. by the time they see this? Oh yeah, when they listen. By to this, the time they listen week. to this, it should be the following yeah. week. Yeah. So um, it's a neat video. Check it out. I mean, I think I think you might be surprised at how quick the thing is going up and down the hill. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think everyone should go out and buy one, but but if it seems interesting. Take a test drive, but mm-hmm. but if you if you Turo one or rent one from somewhere, make sure it's the t- oh, newer than twenty twenty. Yes, big differences. That's when they change the engine, the engineering, everything. And I've heard, I and I, I hate to just say I've heard, but uh, my one of my guys who works at my Playa Vista shop uh, came to us from a dealer, uh, from a, a motorcycle and Polaris dealer, and he's driven all of them, and he goes you don't want the auto he's like the auto is not good they added paddle shifters but it's like it doesn't rev match i mean you you understand why they make an auto because of course 90 percent of the people who buy these things just cruise around and like okay but you if you care about dynamics you want the stick and this guy my employee shout out to him he's got a miata with a roll bar he's got multiple motorcycles like this guy cares about driving yes and so and the shifter in this feels like a Miata shifter. I it's think a it really actually good, solid is a shifter. Miata shifter. Miata transmission. I think so. It's a five speed, and which are hard to find these days. Well, when did me? When did did Miata go to six? Was it the the NC? Was a six speed? The NC, I, I believe. I've ah. never driven an NC. I don't think. I went a, the a, B, NC D. that. Well, I don't even know because the NC that I raced. It might have been a six speed, but on in no track did we ever use sixth gear. Right. So I don't really actually even remember if it was a five or a six speed. It does. But it, it, it feels, feels exactly yeah, like a Miata does, gearbox, which is great. Which Accurate, is, solid, yeah, yeah. but not too heavy. Yeah, it's fine. Um, and great clutch feel. Yeah. So um, shout out to Polaris for um, letting us have a go, and um, and yeah, I mean, I think we had a, we had a good faith go. So yeah. Um, do you want to talk about? The UAW strike? Yeah. 
because they went on strike today. today? First time ever that they they went on strike for the entire big three. Right. Chrysler, Ford, and GM. Right. And the situ- I mean, I, this is a, it's a tough one to do news like this because, like, they might solve this tomorrow, and this podcast True. won't won't. Uh, air for two weeks so there's a huge enormous potential uh, 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 for uh, this to be totally outdated by the time it airs I mean I guess we should say we hope so hopefully it gets resolved on good terms by that time yeah Um, and I watched uh, a bunch of news segments about it I read everything I could Mm -hmm. within reason about it and I have to say I'm pro UAW here yeah I agree um, here's just some numbers that I found, which I am, am pretty sure are, are, you know, the numbers. It's 13,000 people across all three brands, right? Uh, so far, yes. Yeah, so far. As of today, the 15th. Yes. Okay. Um, since 2019, when their last contract started, uh, Ford's profit is up 34%. GM's is up 50% since 2019, but average wages are only up 14.8%, whereas the cost index, cost of living, which factors in inflation and other factors, is up 17.7%. So profits outpacing inflation and cost of living, Mm -hmm. wages underperforming compared to that. CEO pay during that same period is up 30 to 40%. And also, they, they, I saw numbers where they tracked it from the great financial crisis. Because something yeah. I saw a lot of people on Instagram commenting on when the, the Drive put up a story uh, and the people hadn't read the article, they were like, oh, these people are demanding all this money, da, da, da. But they had, a, they had a really strong contract up to the great financial crisis. And then the bailouts happened. Bankruptcy was happening. So the UAW cut down a lot of their benefits and their pay because they went, well, we have to do this because otherwise these companies are gonna go under forever. Yeah. But they did not. They have not gotten back a lot of those benefits or pay since then. And we've watched, obviously, the companies have risen to like great success. Yeah. Even So even before stimulus time and um, and car shortages and all the, the price hikes that have happened, like I think the number was in the time since 2008, their wages have actually only gone up like 6%. Right. Whereas executive compensation and profits have been huge right. because the companies have done a really good job in their restructuring. Right. Um, now the the the, the and, and then the the ratio of CEO pay to median worker pay, uh, the industry average is two seventy two to one, which is very very high. But at Ford, it's two eighty one to one, and at GM, uh oh, lights, <laughs> at GM, it's three sixty two to one. Wow. And there's an argument to be made. Okay, let's ar- let's argue the CEO side. Um, uh, CEO pay can largely be tied to stock performance mm-hmm. and not a base salary. Mm-hmm. So if the company does well, they then do well. Okay, that's an argument. And industry wide, the industry as a whole only has, according to some to some other analysts, like from the Wall Street Journal, four to five percent margins but that doesn't really track because if if these profits are up with ford and gm 34 percent and 50 percent over the last four years does that mean the profit margin does that mean it went from three to four and a half percent does i mean maybe 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 um but the but during the same period corporate stock buybacks are up 1500 percent see that that I have a huge issue with yeah. because this is a very common, well, yeah, subjectively, I think it's a big problem in the United States because instead of taking the revenue and profit and reinvesting it into the company or raising the workers' wages or whatever, they are then buying shares, which inflate the share price, which benefits the CEO. And, and I've heard Prof G, Professor Galloway, does a really good show about this, but a lot of executives have their compensation bonuses tied to share price yeah so it's not just that okay matt you are the president you have a hundred thousand shares and if those go up in value you might sell them and you get to benefit it's that hey if this if hits, hits a certain this value, level yeah which is you, that was a big story recently with lucid and that's what elon musk uh, uh lucid, how elon musk yeah, did it too elon musk got these ridiculously huge bonus payouts mm-hmm. if this stock hit certain targets incentivizing 
stock pumps before each you know quarter end. Right, because it's, it's like it's not it's not a fair. I, I don't think, and people are going to yell in the comments, but I don't think it's a fair representation of how well the company's doing because it's not just built on those share prices aren't based totally on revenue it's like well what if we take the money we're making and then buy our own stock and then do buybacks or like sorry buybacks meaning take shares out raise the price that seems like it's almost fake yeah in a way yeah it's not so i understand why uaw is really pissed yeah and i have the this chart here um and uh, this chart that i got um Senator Mallory McMorrow, former contributor to Jalopnik, uh, wife of former Jalopnik uh, editor Ray Wirt, who uh, I support uh, her campaign. I have supported her campaign. She's the senator from Michigan now, which is pretty fucking crazy. Uh, But she rules. Uh, She posted this chart, which was, uh, you know, CEO compensation relative to revenue. Okay. Uh, Volkswagen's not a small company. Revenue two hundred ninety-five billion. CEO compensation nine point one million. Okay. Toyota two hundred fifty-six billion. CEO compensation five million. Ford revenue one hundred thirty-six billion. CEO compensation twenty-two point eight million. So half the revenue. Half the four revenue. Four times the and compensation. It is just over half the revenue of Toyota, and it is, ju- and it is just over four times the CEO compensation. Uh, GM, 127 billion revenue, okay, 29.1 million CEO compensation. So under half, uh, almost exactly half of Toyota's revenue, right, and six times the CEO compensation. Now, there's an argument to be made. If we cut CEO compensation, would that make the workers happy? And I believe not fully, but it would be a good start. Kids, we got to take one more quick break from the action for electric e-bikes. They sent us a e-bike, electric e-bikes did. And this thing is sweet. Getting outside, you. you I, I love e-bikes, right? I think e-bikes are a great idea because not only uh, are they good exercise, the electric e-bike does have pedals, it's a, it's a pedal bike, but with that battery and pedal assist, you can uh, get places that you might not otherwise go on a bike. Huge hills, for instance. Look, I'm not going to lie and be like, no one can get up a huge hill on a bike. Yeah, some people do. That's like real exercise though and you don't always want to get like super exercise on your bike like on your way to work like for instance if you have one of these electric e-bikes and there's a big hill on your way to work you might not ride a regular bike because you don't want to be at work all sweaty all day right but with electric e-bike you could get there and it's not like a workout you're just getting there right They're fun, they're easy, and they're an affordable way to get moving. With pedal assist and throttle included, plus a convenient foldable design, you can take your fall adventures or your commute to a whole new level. The foldable design is key. The problem with a lot of uh, electric bikes is they're big and they're heavy, and you can't always put them into a car. But with this electric e-bike, it folds up, and uh, our uh, my co-host Zach, uh, he put the electric e-bike in the back of a Honda Fit, Took it with him on a little adventure, got out there, folded it open in five seconds. It was good to go. Electric e-bikes were designed to create a better mode of transportation for all riders, right? Whether you're looking for exercise or trying to get to work or trying to run errands, the electric e-bike is awesome. You can feel more in control with durable features and accessories designed for added safety and convenience. You could save on traditional transportation costs like gas, parking, and maintenance. And you could finance an electric e-bike as low as $73 per month. You can get started today. Uh, The electric e-bike ships free, comes fully assembled, and is foldable for easy travel and storage anywhere you go. E-bikes have the same safety regulations as regular bikes, plus they're durable while staying relatively lightweight. In most states, licensing, registration, etc. are not required for e-bikes, and you can enjoy the same road access as a standard bike. 
right? I like, I love the electric e-bike because it'll just allows me to skip traffic, right? Not use my car. It's great. And it's just, it's fun. It is straight up fun, right? So get out there and try an electric e-bike like their XP Lite starting at just $7.99. Oh yeah, did I say it's affordable? $7.99 for an e-bike is very, very affordable. So visit electricebikes.com to find the electric model for you. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E-bikes.com. Electricebikes.com. Check them out, but let's get back to the show. We are in an era of not totally unprecedented, but it's been a hundred years since we've seen this type of income inequality, since yeah. we had the fucking robber barons and the Rockefellers and the Gettys and people that fucking ruined the world and caused the caused the the Great Depression. We're we're like there. Yeah, I mean there's plenty of charts people can look up especially starting in the 70s where yeah. uh, executive compensation really started what changing. What happened in 1980 that changed this? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's really try and dig deep and figure out what it was in 1980 that nomics. really... Something really, nomics. Something, something nom, I, so, I don't but know. Like, I, look, I know that I'm not an economy economics professor and people are going to yell about that, but you just, just look at the chart of where normal people's income has been, where inflation is, cost of living medical care, universities, pr price of schools, price of housing, all of these things have just gone up and up and up. And yeah. one of the, you know, one of the most, yeah, unfair examples is executive compensation and in my opinion, in the stock buybacks because it's just taking money that used to get reinvested into the company yeah. or hey, we're all working on this, in this company together. We all benefit when we make good cars or good, whatever the product is, but now they can take the money and just inflate the share price, which really only benefits like a small percentage of institutions or people. Yeah. And even, I know that a lot of pensions and things are invested in the stock market, but if you look up the stats of who owns the, um, majority of shares of large companies it's actually not pensions and things it's yeah quite surprising yeah and from 19 from from immediately post world war ii until about 1980 mm -hmm. our economy was designed so that if you built a business the yeah the the, the ownership class could get rich but you would provide a living for hundreds or thousands of people mm -hmm. these people who worked for you I mean, fucking, just look at Married with Children. Remember Married with Children? Mm -hmm. Al Bundy sold fucking shoes, and the house they lived in was considered, like, shitty. And, like, who that fucking works on the assembly line at Ford or GM or in a, in a, in a lot of jobs today could afford that house. Well, okay, interesting point, because I, I know it's a fictional show, but there was a great video that I watched two weeks ago where a lot of boomers have been saying, oh, my kids are complaining they can't buy a house. It's because they're not saving any money. And this person did the math, and the median price of homes has gone up, uh, I think, 6x. Yeah. And, and that's adjusted for inflation and everything, whereas wages have only gone up, as we've said, like a few percentages. Yeah. So it's not, it's not that people are buying avocado toast. It's like the houses are literally yeah. six times more expensive than they used to be, even when you adjust the prices and wages for inflation. Yeah. So so Al, Al with that job, could afford that house back then, so, but, yeah, but today it work, couldn't it because was, the houses are six times more expensive. Yeah. And, and that's not just Los Angeles. That's not just expensive places in California. That is That was median in the country. It's probably worse here. So it's definitely worse here. Yeah, I mean, that's, but, that's like supply, demand, and yeah. you know the people like my we tend to make my more house money here. in thirty other states would be like two hundred thousand. Of course, I <laughs> like mean, it's not like yeah. you know. Uh, it's, I, I live in a nice house, but it's like not that nice. Like, no, but but, but I, I brought that up because a lot of times when we we mention housing prices, people will look at where the complainer lives. Yeah, yeah, and they'll say, "Well, you should move out of Los Angeles." But it doesn't matter if you live in. Small town Oklahoma, Los Angeles, pick a pick a state, the price of your housing has gone up based on just the inflated housing costs right. by multiples. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this this may seem uh, very outdated if the if the strike is resolved before mm -hmm. this show airs, which I hope it is. Um, 
And yeah, there's people that say, well, the U- the union is asking for crazy things. Well, if you ask for things that are seem big and then you get two thirds of them right. and then it, it's resolved. Well, that's how you do that. If you ask for something that's only a little bit and then they negotiate down from there, you're not representing your constituents. Yeah, you properly. have to take big swings because they ask they ask for. Uh, I think their income, they want the same raise the executives have gotten in yeah. the last couple of years. So they wanted like 32% or 40%. And then something that's I haven't read into enough, they wanted a 32-hour work week. Um, but I know there are so there's some fine print with that. It's like 32 hours, yeah. but then if they do overtime, um, which most of them do. I just saw so. a study this morning. Let me put it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my computer real Let's quick. Let's go Look to the this. videotape. I am an intellectual now. Because I put on my new reading glasses. You're an elitist with these yeah. lenses. Um, there was a study in Japan. The Japanese government uh, released their annual economic policy uh, in, tw- in 2021. Oh, wait, was that? Hang on. Is that the article I saw this morning? Is that from today? Hmm? I saw an article from today. Um... No, this isn't from today. This is from April of this year. Um, uh, Let's see. Dozens of countries, including Ireland, Spain, and the UK, have tested a four-day work week with overwhelmingly positive results. Businesses that participated in a six-month trial in the UK ending December 2022 said switching to a four-day work week improved productivity, morale, and team culture. Uh, On the employee side, people said having more personal time, reduced burnout, uh, boosted life satisfaction, no shit. Uh, Although no country has fully adopted this, um, countries are yada, yada, yada. Okay, hang on. Um, There are, let's see, and then they list all these countries. And then in Japan... Uh, In 2021, the Japanese government's annual economic policy guidelines included a recommendation that employee uh, companies let employees opt for a four day week, week, four day work week and three day weekend uh, meant to improve employees work life Mm -hmm. balance, giving them more time to take care of family members for their education or spend time with friends. Um, Certain companies have experimented with this and seen improved productivity. So it's not like crazy. It's no, not a crazy not. thought. I wonder That's, if, I mean, if the good, I, huh. I think if the plants run 24 hours a day, then they just need like another, they'd have to hire people to fill in the, the yeah. gap days, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know the economics of hiring that, that many more people. And I'm sure there are people who will find ways to tell us why we don't know what we're talking about. But like, it seems like if companies are posting record profits, that it just like I, it, I, you know, yes, I own stocks and stuff, but it just seems like the the shareholder economy versus the uh, stakeholder economy, where stakeholders in- include your employees, and they need to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. Just I have I have eight employees here at this small business. And since we opened in 2020, their hourly pay has increased by over 20%. I have th- I increased pay three and a half percent every January 1st, mm-hmm. and then all of, all employees have gotten raises in addition to that. Every every single one of them. And if I hire new people today in 2023, it's six dollars an hour higher higher than where I was hiring them in 2020. And I'm not trying to say like I'm not like a saint. Like uh, there's there's unit economics of that, but like I I don't have people that quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no one no yeah. one's ever quit. So uh, and, and people are getting promotions and people are are moving out of their parents' house and like I, I'm still making a good living over here. You know, it's like I I don't I, my owner's salary is like. I want to say it's it's like five or six of the of the chief of the lowest, not five three hundred. Mm-hmm. Like I, I just it's it seems at a certain level it just seems like greed. Yeah, I mean that's it probably is. Yeah. So uh, that's that's the thoughts on the uh, the strike. Do I have? I don't know if I have anything else on my list. 
I think that's all I got on my list. But we have questions from yeah. our our lovely loyal okay. patrons. Cool. I don't. Uh, yeah, my list is is wiped. Is there anything from the last show's list that I missed? Uh, nope. List done. We have Patreon questions. Uh, if you want to talk to us on the program, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast is the way to do it. Get an ad free listening experience. Uh, ask us questions for the program. Uh, get the show early and uh, live. We're, we'll find a way to make live work even when we're here, but not today. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We just need more of the gear. Um, all right. Chris N asks, what car is the Hublot of the automotive industry? Something people buy with the purposes of trying to show off, but us car people know it's a piece of shit. I mean, it, <laughs> I hate to, the, the Polaris slingshot seems seems like it's there. I mean, it's not a piece of shit. And Hublot is not a piece of shit either. But it's, it is definitely something like the, th it's something where a, a car where you, it, it, yeah, I mean, if it's like something that someone who doesn't know about cars would buy trying to, to be flashy. It's like Maserati. Sure. Which some, I'm not some, saying is a piece of shit. Some Maserati too, like, like there's. It, people, it, Maserati is the entry Ferrari. It's like, it's like an Italian Mercedes and people that buy it tend to be like, they want to be special and want their car to stand out among their peers that probably have BMWs and Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bentegas, you know, I, I do, I love this flying spur. I love the Continental GT, but the Bentega seems like, you know, you're just trying to, it's, it's not that much, that much better than the other luxury SUVs. Oh yeah. True. I just, um, yeah. I just think it's unattractive, but I, I do, I do think the slingshot is bought by by people that are trying to be seen driving something exotic mm. and anyone who knows anything about cars knows that it is actually very cheap right if you own a slingshot please tell us why i'm genuinely curious yeah it's just it, it's i think that the the biggest point against for the slingshot not to belabor this is that if you really if you are a real car enthusiast 35 grand in the used market will get you any number so of very cool cars that have great dynamics, have real safety features, <laughs> are enclosed, you know, like you're you're right in the in the wheelhouse of of secondhand but great condition F types, Caymans, Corvettes, Camaros, Mustangs, Camaros and Mustangs, Miatas. Um, if you yeah, want, I mean, soft top. Uh, M yeah. M3s. Yeah. Um, uh, looking around here, uh, I mean, possibly even nah, maybe not an NSX unless it's got a lot of miles on it. But yeah, but 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 you can get if you're looking for a great sports car experience, a great sports car experience from some of these secondhand cars where people won't look at you like you're a like you're a somebody. Right. So so I would say that's probably it. All right. Chris Tebow uh, says, I drive a Volvo C30 and was wondering what your thoughts are about this car. Um, I've only owned front wheel drive Swedish cars and was wondering if you can tell the difference between rear wheel drive and front wheel drive when just driving around town. Uh, well, you can't you certainly can't when puttering around town, but you can if you start to pick up the pace a little bit. Mm -hmm. I reviewed C30s. It's I think it's one of the more dynamically it's one of the more disappointing cars i've ever driven because i wanted it to be so great and mm -hmm. it just didn't drive very good um specifically like the r design polestar one like what a great looking car that just drove bleh. it it looked like it looked like a great hot hatch yeah but it had none of the hot hatch energy yeah. that all the other competitors at the time had um it felt like an s60 yeah. which is like a big heavy safe sedan yeah but it didn't feel any it didn't that's yeah. what it felt like the inputs were very rubbery and and soft and and not really very direct i remember it had lots of um understeer torque steer and it just it would not hook up coming out of a corner and it just felt it just kind of like I mean the slingshot like it feels like something in the front and something else in the back yeah and the C30 to me felt like that especially when the back looks so cool yeah looked great I mean it, it was a great looking design and 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 really uh, 
I mean, not quite P1800, but it had some cool P1800 things. And there might be shit you could do to it in the aftermarket that'll fix it, but they just didn't drive very mm-hmm. well. And so they were, they were, to me, disappointing. But if you like one, if you like it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shit on you. Okay. Um, this is a motorcycle question from Dax. It's a little long. I hope we can help because uh, I read it beforehand. Uh, Daxa says, I'm planning to go motorcycle racing next year. I wanted to enter the lowest class, which is 250cc, and I'd have 12 months to gain five seconds to be on pace with the fast people, but then I would not have any wheel-to-wheel practice until the first race. Uh, You can get amateur wheel-to-wheel practice in a higher class, but then you won't be competitive because you're starting in a higher class. So basically, should... I think it's I think it's a sheet. Should Daxa choose the 250 cc where you don't practice wheel to wheel until you race somebody, or move up a class to Super Sport 600 cc, um, which is just like a big thing to bite off. Yeah, I vote 250. I would vote 250 as well, but I would also vote if you can afford it, going to a motorcycle racing school. Yes, where you will get some experience. If not necessarily wheel to wheel, like on a track with other people. Yeah, Corey Burns. He the, there's a BMW school at Laguna, although that's one one thousand RRs. Keith Code, who's literally written the yeah. books on motorcycle racing and high performance motorcycle riding. Uh, there's they, he has a school that's based out of Willow Springs. My thought is, if you start with two fifty, yeah, you're on it. And this, I think this applies to any type of racing and car, whatever. If you start with a slower vehicle, you'll learn the dynamics at a safer speed. You can learn how to drive or ride. And then when you start bringing in other riders, like that's a separate skill. Now you're learning to yeah. race in traffic. Just treat them like two different lessons. Instead of trying to learn everything at once with a 600 or whatever car, like at speed. That's right. just, it's a lot to process. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say slower, but but... If you can find a way outside of doing a race itself to ride with other people on the track, mm-hmm. I would do that. Yeah. Um, Derek, we've we've talked about Nixon watches before. Like they look cool. Yeah, I mean, they're not I, investments. I, no, right. I mean there's there are Nixon collectors out there, but like that's a fashion watch. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're not. I don't want to say it's like disposable, but it's not like a horological thing it's just like they're fashion watches Mm -hmm. and if you like one buy one and whatever yeah they sponsored a lot of skateboarders and snowboarders when i was in college yeah yeah, yeah. um mike manio wants a sub fifteen thousand fifteen thousand dollar rear wheel drive manual v8 to drive hard and put away wet something that you can beat on and won't break he's thinking new edge mustang or maybe an s197 gt yeah i mean there's, not, not there's only F540. so many options here. Yeah. Um, you, you've got Mustangs, Camaros, Corvettes. Uh, I mean, the BMW M3, is that's going to be too expensive. Yeah, and you also mentioned E39 F540. That will also be too expensive. Yeah, yeah, the, the, you're not going to want that. You don't want to drive it hard and put it away. Yeah, that's yeah. not good. I, I mean, your Mustangs and Camaros are your friends here. Um, S197 Mustang with some maximum motorsports suspension bits is probably what you want. For 15, you can get such a strong Mustang with yeah. that stuff. I'm not a fan of the New Edge Mustangs. I'd rather have an SN95 than a New Edge. They're essentially the same car. Um, and you could buy an SN95 for pretty cheap. And they're pretty, they're they're basically Fox bodies underneath. That's true. But like. They do look better than the New Edge. The, the curvy ones do look much better. Yeah. And yeah. The, was, it, was the interior the same on SN95 and, and the new edge new interior edge? is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's definitely no reason for, no. in my opinion, to go new edge. If yeah. you can, but if you can afford S197, the, even the early one, like the 2011. Yeah. Like it's a small car. It looks great still. And then the maximum part. Early S197 like would be like an 05. Oh, uh, what did, oh, Musto's was 2011. Yeah. That yeah. Was well, that's when they went to the Coyote was 2011. Oh shit. Yeah. It was, a, it was a three valve from 05 to 2010. And then they. And then they went uh, to the Coyote 2011 to 14. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you can afford one with a Coyote, that's that's where it's at. But, but these the, days, but the probably not for 15. May I mean maybe I, I I haven't looked, but like yeah, Mustangs are Mustangs are your friend here. Yeah. 
Uh, Gabe Colston, um, what can car companies do to SUVs to make them more appealing to enthusiasts while keeping them affordable? The Hyundai Kona N comes to mind, but there isn't much competition outside of that. The Kona is not really a SUV. No, the Kona it's a is, a, hatch. is a is a hatch that's an inch and a half taller than other hatches. Um, and so, very fun to drive. Like sure, I, I think I've had a great time with that in the canyons before. Yeah, it's it's fine. So I mean, the question is, are we talking about SUVs or are we talking about like very small crossovers? If we're talking about very small crossovers, then embracing rally car is is my my suggestion which some companies have done um the mercedes gla 45 comes to mind the macan has you know comes to mind um i mean i know not only personally but at the shop a lot of car enthusiasts whose daily driver is an suv of some kind and you know that's what they choose to drive every day i also think that like you know, going going trucky like the the new Bronco or the reissued Land Cruiser. Uh, I just read that Nissan is bringing back some kind of hard body Frontier thing. So making their trucks trucks mm-hmm. and making their small crossovers rally cars. I think would would be. I good. feel like there are plenty of options. Like yeah. if you want a car, if you want an SUV that can handle well and and pretend to be a sports car, you have choices. And then the other option, which companies have known for a long time, is you do the overland off road thing. Mm-hmm. So I I don't know what how much more of the enthusiast market you want to attract, or what I'm not sure what Gabe thinks is lacking really. Yeah. Um, Philip, Philip Franca, uh, regarding your GR86 Cup review, does the GR and BRZ reported oiling issues on track affect the way you think of that car versus the Miata Cup. The, um, the GR Cup car has a baffled oil pan hmm. as part because it's it runs on slicks. Yep. So you would need that anyway. Um, so if, you, if you're doing track work in those cars, I would recommend a baffled oil pan no matter what. The race car already has one. Okay. Uh, Luke Talian says... What are some of the best modern, parentheses, post-2000, front-wheel drive or front-wheel drive biased sports cars? Uh, you know, the, the GTI, as long as you have the diff, the Civic Type R and the Integra Type S, for sure. Uh, Fiesta ST. Fiesta ST, absolutely. Um, he follows with, do equivalently, equivalently priced or cheaper rear-wheel drive, all-wheel drive cars of the same era always beat them from a driving experience perspective? I would say no. Like, no. The Fiesta ST is more fun and had better inputs and response than plenty of rear-wheel drive cars of that generation. Like, yeah. I'd rather, I would rather drive a 2014 Fiesta ST through the canyons than a 2014 Mustang GT yeah. until they started adding the track packs. Yeah. I mean, I, to me, what what works about the very best cars whichever wheels are driven is a sharpness of inputs you know little little inputs that result in proportional changes you don't want to have to make big inputs Hmm. and and you want directness through the shifter directness through the throttle directness through the steering wheel and like the fiesta st did that better than cars costing three or four times as much you know at that time so the SST might be the best front-wheel drive car I've driven maybe ever. I know people, I mean, I know people say Integra Type R, mm-hmm. but I've driven those, and I think the Fiesta ST was a better front-wheel drive car than that. I would have to drive them back-to-back, because I drove I drove the, the Type R in, like, 2022, mm-hmm. and the Fiesta ST was, like, when you had one. So yeah. that was six years before that. Yeah. Fiesta ST rocked. Um, Devin Ward has a funny question. He says, supercar ownership training. What are some of the best cars with a low price of entry, but extremely expensive maintenance costs that would be that would be a pressure test for someone aspiring to own a supercar? <laughs> cheap um, to buy, expensive to own. I mean, it's not cheap to buy, but a Ferrari 355, you know, can could still could still be had for hundred to a hundred and twenty thousand dollars 
we talked about it on the last show uh the old m6 yeah like an 80s bmw probably M5 not that expensive to get into but really very very expensive, expensive to own. maintain yeah um, oh the porsche 928s yep how much can you get one of those for like a ratty one i mean 20 grand okay for for like an okay one and it'll cost you and a they're lot more a fortune to, to keep going so bad a lot of people are very surprised at how much air-cooled Porsches cost to keep going because they're known for their durability. They do last a long time, but they are, ex you know, expensive to to, to keep going. Um, the parts are expensive. The, 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 the skilled labor that goes into fixing them are expensive. And so um, even a, a fairly a fairly cheap air-cooled Porsche is going to be expensive to run. Mm -hmm. NSX is I mean, my NSX major service was over $5,000. It's more expensive than my Ferrari 328 major service. Whoa. Um, now, that could be because I, Donnie cuts me a little break because he likes being in the videos. And, and the other the place, Evasive Motorsports, that did my NSX service was kind of a full retail sort of deal. But still, most people talk about the NSX like it's just a Honda. And it is not just a Honda. It has a lot of unique stuff and a lot of unique needs that 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 need attending to um, if you want to keep that car ace. Corvettes, I mean, Cor yeah. a Corvette powertrain is very, very dur durable, but Corvettes have a lot of unique parts that are not shared with any other GM car. Look, our really C6 project, the armrest situation yeah. was like $400 on eBay. Yeah. Uh, getting a clutch done it was three to four thousand dollars yeah and we got a clutch um from center force from center force thank you so much and still like the labor because they have to take out the torque tube and the transaxle yeah. like it is a very uh in-depth process so those are a lot of options mm -hmm. and then of course uh honorable mention to like the 2001 750 you know, oh bmw like, oh yeah one yeah of 12 the, cylinder bmws god help you one of the worst cars built yeah uh crisp ono says um which cars are the most rewarding to master meaning the car that is not necessarily easy to jump in and drive hard but offers a richer experience as you become familiar um mm -hmm. well, that's i mean that's interesting uh the i mean mastering i would say i don't know i don't know i think it makes the assumption i've ever mastered anything but you know rear engine porsches at the limit can be challenging uh if you're not familiar with how to like especially an air-cooled car like a shorter wheelbase older car those you really have to be comfortable with before mm -hmm. you can start driving them really fast um hmm it's interesting Hard to master, steep learning curve. Hmm. Uh, I think, well, I mean, old cars, like my my Shelby Cobras, like yeah. they, they feel weird because the controls are old and things that have slower steering, um, yeah. but have high levels of grip and acceleration. Because nowadays we're so used to this quick steering rack and where you just, your thought becomes the input, which becomes the car's action. Right. And it's so, it's so quick, but you know, 30, 40 years ago, some of the cars were as fast in a straight line and could generate a, a high amount of grip, not as much as a modern car. But then all of a sudden you're moving this like weird heavy gear lever, you know, with challenging ergonomics like that yeah. can be re rewarding if you can put it together. Yeah. Like very fast race cars from before sequential gearboxes, mm. like manual shift, but like pro grade race cars pretty challenging yeah yeah and or anything where anything with like real downforce oh I mean, yeah that's 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 very very tricky because if you're going fast enough to really be pushing the limits of the tires but before that downforce is giving you a help to crossing that barrier that that takes not just practice but also like bravery yeah yeah i have no experience in that but i've read that that is a yeah it's hard it's quite a threshold yeah um, any thoughts? Oh, Douglas Le Levy asks, any thoughts on Longinus? Considering adding one no, to my Longine. collection. Longine. I uh, knew, they I make knew it was okay wrong watch. when I said it. Yeah, yeah. They make, they make it all right watch. Is that a fish? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, he says 3500 bucks. It's for, when you get your jeans cut very long. Long, long, long jeans. Yeah. <laughs> By Pedro's long, yeah. long jeans. Uh, they make, they make a fine watch. I don't think they're... 
except for some of the vintage ones they're not particularly collectible but as as far as a um a step above entry level you know it's between between entry level like seiko stuff and and the real deal uh big money swiss stuff as an in-between same level as like bomb mercier or mont blanc or um tissot it's it's that sort of mid-range uh but quality items okay um ivan capote which car for you represents each state we're not gonna do holy state. shit 50 fucking cars we could do that for a whole show in the future uh but he he said like california represents a uh, represented by Prius or maybe Tesla. Um, Certainly Tesla now. Yeah. I mean, let's pick a state. Uh, all right, give me three. Give me three states. Let's Florida. Do, Florida is obviously the Hellcat. To me, Florida is just Hellcat. Yeah, but the Challenger, not the Charger. Yeah, I mean, doesn't. All right, fine, sure. No, it's because I feel like it handles worse. But Florida's yeah. all straight lines. Yeah. Uh, Florida would be the Minnesota. Hellcat. Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a a 2001 Jeep Cherokee Sport. I think, uh, I feel like it would be a Forester for like a 2014. Yeah. Um, and how let's about, do... How no. about West Virginia? Oh, that is a Chevy... 1500 like a 94 chevy mm. 1500 pickup truck uh -huh. but one of the doors doesn't match the rest of the body color <laughs> yeah that's pretty good yeah i was gonna say something roughly that i'm not yeah. trying to be too disrespectful but <laughs> that's a little I've been to west I virginia yeah uh west virginia has shockingly good roads i'll say something nice about west virginia they do. their back roads are exceptional um the coal is delicious <laughs> uh, Prashan says, uh, I collect CVS diecast cars and I like to see if I can complete a set. What, quote, full set would you like to see parked next to each other at WCCS? Oh, so his diecast set is the Veyron and the Chiron or oh. all three, four GTs. So like, oh. what, what would you like to see parked here? Uh, I'd like to see every V12 Lamborghini. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So... So a 350, a 400, a Miura, an Espada, a oh, Jarama, uh, a, uh, an LMO to Countach, Diablo, Mercy, and Aventador. That's, I mean, it's like 10 cars. Yeah. But, yeah, but that's. That might happen. You could, if you did a Lambo I think it would be, here. Yeah, I think it would be very unlikely to get a 350, a 400, and a Jarama. I know there's at least two Jaramas in L.A. Oh, and I miss oh, Islero. I missed the Islero. Adam Carolla has one of those. See, it's doable. Um, it is doable, but it, but it would be, be very challenging. More likely the Peterson would do a Lamborghini display for a month. Right. And that's where it would be. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool. Um, we, ha we have at Playa Vista, we've got Diablo, Mercy, Aventador, and Countach. So that's pr that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You need the LMO too. Shit. I don't know Take if actually want, if that would fit. I don't think it would fit on the lift. I don't lift. think it would fit here. I think it might. It, it would fit here. Yeah. But I don't know about up there. Hmm. Um, Jack Vogler asks for our tire opinions. What do we have on our personal cars? Uh, I have Redstein Hypertrax I've had on my car for like three years now, which I think they're getting replaced soon. Yeah. And you have lots of PS... No, you, you have a mix no, of stuff. No, I, I have a blend. I've got Vredestein on the, on the Mach-E, um, which they did give me, and I, and I do like them, actually. I've got Conti's on the Ferrari, um, which Donnie says are his favorite tire on the 328. I have the OE spec Pirelli P0 on the Countach. I have... Dunlop SP Sportmax race on the um, Spider, which is what came with it from the factory. And when those burn off, I will replace them with PS4Ss. Um, those have actually been better than I expected, those Dunlops. They're all right. Um, but I, I don't need an R compound tire, and I don't want an R compound tire, so I'll replace them with PS4Ss. And I've got... What did I just get? Uh, Dunlop Dereza's something somethings on the NSX. It is very, very hard to get fitments for that. 17 front, 18 rear. Um, it's, unless, unless you're getting like, like a 
fairly shitty all season or like a super hardcore autocross tire. Mm-hmm. It's it was really hard to get a match set um, for the NSX, and that was the best tire that was available for that car. Yeah, I think that's all the cars. Oh, the the Delica has Falcon Wild Peaks on it. And the POW has Yokohama Bicycles, something or others. Actually, it has tires that are like way too nice for 55 horsepower, but it came on, they came it, on the car. It grips up nicely. Yeah. Uh, Go Mufuni, uh, long-time listener, first-time patron, welcome to the party, um, is getting a company car. So they are Ooh. able to sell their Volvo XC60, which will get them about 35 grand. They want a weekend car, so they want a manual coupe hatch. And they're deciding between an 07 Z4M coupe and a 2013 TTRS. Uh, oh, that's they, interesting. They like these two because of the rear seat delete makes the hatch larger for the dog on weekend trips. Oh, that's Ooh. interesting. Uh, you could also get a John Cooper Works Mini and do a rear seat delete kit and have the biggest trunk ever. True. Which is what I did in my John Cooper Works Mini. Yeah, that's true. That was pretty rad, actually. I could fit so much shit back there. I could fit a drum set back there. Yeah, we used to bring all the production gear in Thad's Mini yeah. to drive up to the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, like huge Pelicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, both of those cars are very cool. I think, you know, the TTRS is all wheel drive, but front wheel drive biased, mm-hmm. and the Z4M is very much rear drive. Yeah. Uh, Z4M was the last M car to start with a key, use an actual physical key. Before they moved to the button. Yeah. TTRS um, has a wonderful engine. It does. And it's you can easily tune tunable to be very, very fast. Yes. Um, so I would say if, if you want something tunable, the TTRS is where it's at. The S54 engine that's in the in the Z4M is you should mostly leave it alone. Yeah. Um, both good choices, though. That's hard. Yeah, both they're, good And they're choices. really different flavors of car. Yeah. I mean... I would say I I would say if if you if you want the all wheel drive for for weather and if you want to be able to tune it go TTRS and if you want it just to kind of be as it is uh, Z4M is probably a little more collectible mm-hmm. uh, and and is probably better in totally stock form. Yeah, I think the nice thing with the TTRS is even though it's front wheel drive biased, I don't think it's not a huge detriment like it handled really nice yeah. it responded well and it's really fast like you can still have a really great time in twisty roads with that car yeah they're cool and yeah. you don't see them yeah you don't not enough uh wyatt b uh recently got into 35 millimeter photography film photography mm. they got a minolta autofocus cheater camera to start and an olympus pen ft half frame slr what is the most satisfying and or tactile 35 millimeter camera you have used Oof. I mean, I have a. I have not used that many different thirty-five millimeter cameras. I had one camera from when I was eleven until I until now, and it's a Pentax K one thousand, and it feels like a Beretta Model ninety two handgun when you pull the pull the frame. It's like clack. It's very, very satisfying. Um, I think cameras that don't have an auto winder, you know, where you have to wind to the next frame with the lever, I think that's very satisfying. Um, But uh, I don't have a lot of experience, so I can't... It's not like cars where I've driven 10,000 of them. It's like I've used two different 35 millimeter cameras and I liked one better than the other. And that was my Pentax K1000, which I have, I still have. And I, I've shot some film with it. I took it to, oh, yeah. I took it to Morocco and I shot the 911 Dakar with it. Is the one you brought to Tahiti with the full view? Yeah. Okay. The problem, the problem was, uh, with 35, <laughs> now we know that we now know the cadence of our light timers here. <laughs> the problem with 35 is it's like, it just looks shitty by today's standards. Like it's just grain. It's really grainy, and and so you gotta. You know, I like I like shooting medium and large format if I can today. I realize it's not for everybody, but just to get the image quality that you're looking for, and even like the richest color film is pretty washed out compared to what you can do with digital now. So I might just go back to black and white. Mm, that's a good idea. But film is very satisfying. I do like it. I like it because it's like, clack, and then you wind it up. And then I like it because you don't know if the shot came out until you get it later. 
you know, you don't, we there's no in, instant gratification. We were in the Ansel Adams forest on my camping trip and Sarah, you know, we get to this Vista and it's like green and blue and snow and mountains. Yeah. And she's like, Ansel Adams was a jerk, like all this color. And he robbed everybody of it. But, well, he you know, didn't, he, had a, he didn't have a choice. I figured he was yeah. shooting in black and right. white because that's, that's what, what it was. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> so he had to go for contrast. Yeah. He had to stand he out. He had to go for contrast and he was shooting with an eight by 10 camera, which he mounted up. He built a platform on top of his station wagon and had a, and basically just set up his camera on top of the wagon. That's amazing. It was pretty awesome. How big is that camera? Like It's eight, eight by 10. So the negative is eight by 10. Oh, geez. So instead of a 35 millimeter, which is like the size of a postage stamp, it's, Whoa. it's the size of this. Well, this is a, this is a 13 inch right. MacBook Pro, but it's the size of a piece of notebook paper. Um, and when you blow up an image, even if it's pretty big, you're only blowing the image up from the negative four times right. five you know five times so it really the, it's just unbelievable levels of detail yeah, yeah. i shot with an eight by ten in college it's rad but every shutter pull was like 25 dollars <laughs> yeah that's insane it's so it's it's you got to be you got to take your time really set up that shot one shot one yeah kill. you're not just you're not just uh pulling the pulling the shutter right. and then seeing what happens yeah, oh my god yeah um son of sandy needs help finding the fizzy lightweight car that will satisfy uh him because he mentions his prostate but he has tried <laughs> and owned uh an s2000 stock and ls swapped an s550 mustang sti's 370z and both a fiesta and a focus st hatch TDI Volkswagen and an MR2 and Civic SIs. Uh-huh. And still isn't sure what is this favorite fizziest vehicle. I mean, you might have to go for like Ariel Adam at that right? point. I, mean, I think if you need the heroin. If you, you C- would, cater them. Yeah. I or think, or I Lotus think, Exige. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Exige would be the most practical thing on that list. I would say you, if you, if you weren't happy with an LS swapped S2000, I think it's time to go for the heroin. Yeah, where it's like you either need you need something that doesn't weigh anything, a caterum or an aerial atom, where you really have a possibility of death, or you know like a tuned Evo that's like six hundred horsepower mm-hmm. and just buzzes like crazy. Yeah, uh, something that race car adjacent is what we need. Yeah, I mean, or I mean, if your budget allows like a GT three or something like that, like a really a, a, a racy Porsche. Um, GT3 RS of whatever if, yeah, generation. Yeah, if you've, got, if you've yeah. got GT3 RS money, or, you know Porsche real real fast Porsche money, that that might do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vin from Hoonigan seems very happy with his. He's he's kept it like the longest of his cars. Yeah, but he just he just sent it to like Dundon for like the full header. It's gonna be the it's gonna be so loud. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I know that company makes a high quality product, but I do not want any of that. The muffler. No, the cat he showed in the video was like half a coke can in terms of size it was like yeah. the smallest catalytic converter i've ever seen yeah um michael cosgrove says uh is the bentley flying spur still the number one choice for a sporting luxury sedan to fit tall people in the back uh possibly panamera but mm-hmm. i think that i think it's i think it's kind of a wash especially if you go with the extended wheelbase panamera um and assuming you're not talking about rolls royces because he says sporty but it's Plenty roomy back there, but Panamera still fit will fit tall people nicely. All right, last two. Uh, Chris Gordziel uh, is thinking about replacing his wife's Perperite Metallic 2017 Porsche Cayenne SE Hybrid. Currently has a Volt and a K5 Blazer Resto Mod. Mm. Needs something that seats five, but could be smaller than the Cayenne, and they and prefers something uh, PHEV. Wouldn't mind sporty luxury under 70K. He XC60 was thinking, recharge. Yeah. He was thinking V60 Polestar, but XC60 Oh, yeah, e- either one. I mean, if you want a wagon, go the V60. If you want something a little taller, the, the XC60 recharge is excellent. And uh, Jason asks, is there any merch for sale at WCCS? No. Uh, if you physically come take a tour, you can buy a hat like I'm wearing. Um, that's all we've got right now. Vinny is working on an online shop where you'll be able to buy t-shirts and hoodies and stuff with our logo on it. It's not available yet, but if you physically come take a tour, we will sell you a hat, uh, in the shop. We will not mail them. We just, I don't have the bandwidth to sell it, send out merch right now. Um, but yeah. All right. That's it. 
Yeah, that's great. It. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I'm going to Road and Tracks Performance Car of the Year. In fact, by the time you is that no, that's not this week. That's the following week. This show is for next week, yep. where I will be. Uh, I'll be going to Sonoma for the Nissan uh, Nismo Z mm-hmm. at Sonoma, and Zach will go be going to Italy for 911 ST. Yes, which is couple of couple of good ones there on the uh, on the schedule and then the next week is performance car of the year uh road and track which is very excited uh you know who has joined uh road and track staff hmm. mr jethro bovington oh cool so he will be joining us for Peacody. oh awesome and i might um i might be able to get a podcast in the cam with him uh as well and uh okay thanks to our patrons for patroning appreciate that thanks to the rest of you for listening and uh we will see you guys next time bye